Hello and welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. Today we are thrilled to present the exhibition, A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023. This exhibition is a result of collaboration between the Ohio Advisory Group to the National Museum of Women in the Arts and the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. And I am super excited because we have our co-curators here today and I'm gonna let them tell you who they are, where they're coming from and how they've put together this exhibition. So I will hand it to you. Uh, my name is Matt Distel. I am the uh, executive director at the Carnegie in Covington, Kentucky and a Cincinnati-based curator and one of the co-curators of this exhibition with... Hi, my name is Sora Kang and I'm a an, uh, curator and uh, educator based in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm also the Director of Galleries and Outreach at Northern Kentucky University. Perfect, so um, let's get started. We're gonna take a tour around this exhibition and it makes perfect sense for us to actually start with uh, the artists that are back here. In the flex space, we have Tu Tran. Will you tell us a little bit about Tu and about her work here? Tu is an artist based in Cleveland and uh, Tu makes works that are, uh, I think it's probably safe to say that these are the most uh, kinetic works in the show in terms of uh, visually. Uh, two is dealing with a lot of uh, pop culture images but also playing with um, meme culture, uh, a lot of online culture but it still feels very analog, right? She's building these practical sets to film these things that sort of end up having a life online. Um, this particular project, uh, there is a wild looking massage chair that feels like a waterfall and you're meant to sort of sit in this chair, uh, get your massage and watch, um, you know, some cat videos, right? Um, I, it's a really fun piece to experience. Um, I think we're going to go inside and take a look at it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Her work definitely delves into the arena of the absurd, uh, which you can see from a compilation of these collaged interactive puppet like cat imagery. And she likes to use outdated modes of technology, which has this sort of like, I don't know if like it's analog is the word for it, sort of vibe. But even with the mas massage chair that she made, there is some definitely going in the like arena of kitsch. Uh, and also speaking of like this exhibition and thinking about the times in which artists were making work. So being in the pandemic, using resources that were available to them uh, two had this massage chair sort of in the basement, which she used that as a source and then kind of had to reconfigure back into this gallery, just the logistics of cutting it in half and getting it out of that space into this space, which I think is also really interesting and very resourceful. Yeah, it all has a really great DIY feel to it. For sure, for sure. So that's um, a great segue to our next artist, who is Catherine Whited here on this wall over here, and I'm gonna get right out of the way so that our co-curators can chat about it and Andrew can see the works up close. So this is uh, Catherine Whited. Catherine is artist based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, she works with a, a studio called Visionaries and Voices, which is a really wonderful studio with a lot of great artists um, that works with adults with disabilities. Uh, Catherine, these, this is pretty much the mode that Catherine works in, which is, uh, she creates lists. Sometimes she asks people to give her lists. Uh, it could be something like uh, all the items on a shelf at the store. It could be everything in her fridge, everything that she needs to pack for a trip, all of these. So she creates these lists and then sets about illustrating them. Um, the way that I think this makes a lot of sense with um, A New World in particular is she's actively cataloging everything in her environment. Um, and it's meticulous. You can kind of see the care that she takes with each object um, and sort of how she interprets it. And she interprets it into, you know, it, it's reductive um, in the sense that it is sort of trading on minimalism and, and those sort of sensibilities of turning maybe sometimes more complex shape uh, objects into simple shapes or a series of shapes. Uh, you can see the, the, the marks that she makes, like the, the um, to sort of make sure that the, the text, which I feel like is just as important, is all neatly ordered. Uh, these are, I think they're really wonderful pieces. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. There's definitely a systematic approach in which she renders these images. They're all sized exactly the same. There's a deceptive precision to that. Um, 
uh, especially you can see it in the, the handwriting, you could see it in the repetition of some of the forms like these eggs. And what's really relatable and interesting about these works is they're all everyday items or things that we recognize. So I feel like the viewer will have some form of intimate connection with the items they see. And it's nice to see that these everyday items are the focal point of her sort of very calculated um, drawings. Yeah, it's a real record. It's a real document of a life. So you all were chatting about that kind of cataloging as um, one of the pillars of your curatorial ethos for this exhibition, which also nicely transitions us to our next artist, Ha Zheng. But would you please talk a little bit more about how you kind of shaped the curatorial narrative for this exhibition, how you selected artists, the 11 folks that are in this exhibition, and, and then take us to Ha's work? I think our approach was generally trying to find a range of responses to what a new world meant. Um, it's not necessarily all about proposing new worlds or new ways that we are going to live in the future. It's more, we sort of equally try to take the approach of how are artists dealing with our current world, which is a constantly new world. Um, and so that, that element of sort of looking backwards um, at things that are both personal and exist in pop culture or in larger, you know, in a more communal sense was equally important. Yeah, I think if we're going to talk about the future, we have to talk about the present because our actions and what we do in the immediate present is what informs the outcome of what unfolds in the future. And I think a lot of the artists, you know, they were all informed by what was going on in the world. So it, the pandemic. Um, being in the confines of their studio spaces, their homes, the restrictions, um, all of these things. And I think a new world as a theme is incredibly expansive. I think you can take it in many directions, thematically or conceptually or materially. And I think that those components really manifested in very different ways, but there's definitely co connections between the artists. Um, and I think world building and the archive, I think those things also go hand in hand. So how are we directly responding to the world around us? How are the artists reimagining the world that they're occupying? Yeah. So here we're going to talk about Ha. Um, do you want to start? Yeah. So Ha Zhang uh, is a Cincinnati-based artist. She's interdisciplinary. She's also a professor at the University of Cincinnati. And we can definitely see those archival components in this piece. Uh, so we have these images that are a reflection of her life. They're very intimate, almost voyeuristic scenes, and they're paired with text, so avoid, uh, fearful and avoidant. And we can see that avoidant is obscured because it's upside down. Definitely makes the work more interactive. It makes us think, how do these words tie to the scenes that are unfolding before us? How do the words also implicate us and in, in how we relate to these terms or how these can be manifested in someone else. So with Ha, she definitely tries to um, you know, explore these, these themes of intimacy and how you know, these terms could very, like, I don't know, broadly apply to people mm -hmm. and not just the scenes that we're making our connections with. Yeah, and I think the, the thing that hits me too, and I've experienced this piece quite a few times, and it keeps revealing new things to me, but like the vulnerability of Ha, who is the person in the, in the images, um, is, feels really striking at the moment. And, you know, the fearful component, peering through the window, the avoidance, sort of just crashing on the couch, but like noticing little things like the, the keys still dangling in the door, um, that all sort of creates this unease um, and this sort of disquiet around... Um, what are the actions of the figure in the mm. in the space? And you know, I do really enjoy. And this is going to be a recurring theme throughout a lot of the exhibition. That fearful, and then avoidant flipped upside down, sort of forces the viewer into sort of interacting with the space, even if it's just kind of trying to tilt your head to figure out what that word is. Um, so, artists interested in sort of moving the viewer's bodies around uh, seems to kind of keep popping back up and various spots throughout the exhibition. Yeah, and I think the level of ambiguity also contributes to like the resounding mood of the photograph. So when we look at them, 
how do these words apply to these images? I think the question is open-ended enough that people can have different interpretations, but the words themselves by definition are very loaded. So what does that mean when we look at these bodies that are within the frame, where we're not even sure if it's a self-portrait because the faces aren't completely visible? So it's interesting to kind of fill in those gaps with narratives that we're kind of developing as we spend time with the work. Yeah, it forces the viewer to be part of it, yeah. right? And I, I really appreciate the use of, of neon in this because while it's like a, a broad word that is impactful, you, if you're choosing to put it into neon, it has uh, an elevated importance mm -hmm. that's pretty interesting. Also, like when you think about neon, often it's about what's open or closed. And mm -hmm. that's an interesting yeah. concept to think about too. Yeah. It, it's, it's also, I mean, you don't usually experience neon in a space like this. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's bright, it's kind of searing. So it impacts how you close you can get to the work in certain ways. For sure. Cool. Well, let's, um, let's head over and have a look at Kat's work. Okay. Um, Kat has a couple of surprises for us. So if you wouldn't mind um, talking us through. So Kat is a Cleveland-based artist. Um, and uh, this project uh, in particular, so Kat is, has like a printmaking background. Um, and she, Kat, they talk about their work being very, uh, very much about experimentation and occasionally failure. And so some of these like printing processes are not are very non-traditional printing processes, but the process is exposed throughout it. So the narrative component of this is um, based on a true news story, a news item of a, a person, an astronaut in a space station using some access they had to uh, um, information to spy on a former partner. So this is like a space crime, um, the first one, they think. Um, and so these elements are sort of like placed throughout. So there's, there's components of it that sort of tell that story, but there's also this sort of broader um, implication of uh, space exploration. And the thing that I really enjoy that Kat did in this um, particular installation is you will be rewarded by exploring the space. Um, so you will, as you kind of move through the entire exhibition, there's a couple of like hidden little surprises Easter eggy type items um, where there's other elements uh, these, of these physical pieces that are um, sort of around corners and in little nooks and crannies. And I, I really like it when an artist plays with your space again like that. So that's another example of artists moving us through the physical spaces. Do you want to take, do you want to hide, try to find one? You okay? Yeah, and it's interesting that she uses silicone. There's definitely a tactile component to the exhibition as well. But I kind of love the, this idea of absurdity that, and humor that comes through her work, uh, which is kind of reminiscent in, in two trans work in this way. But just like the unbelievable aspect of space travel and that sort of achievement paired with something incredibly human as like going through a breakup and uh, the story of her, this, I don't know, like, I think she was checking a bank account yeah. uh, from space and then that got tracked and that created some sort of contention with her former partner of her kind of spying on her yeah. finances. <laughs> so it's so interesting that we have like this very fantastical component of space travel paired with something very real that happens to everyone and brings out this very interesting story. And there's a real improvisation that's happening here too, right? Where Kat was not necessarily thinking about exactly where those pieces would go when they came into the space, but then playing with it once yeah. they Yeah, Yeah, that was a really here. important piece of it that uh, she was talking to me about and wanting to come in once there were works already up cool. that she could react to. Um, so there, there is a real playfulness to it, um, even in the softies on the, on the floor yeah. that are ostensibly reversed um, prints of Birkenstock shoes, which you know, yeah. that's fantastic. Think there, about something physical being a print too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, and there's, there's one more that's just around the corner that I think we should give you a preview to so you can come and check it out in person. But it's just around the corner here. 
So you got to come and see this in person as well, just because, you know, it's fun to have discoveries within a space. Yeah, come on in here and poke around, man. So, so using humor is a really uh, compelling piece to this exhibition. And so that naturally kind of takes us to our next artist, which is Erica Townsend. And um, Erica is here with three pieces that uh, Sora and Matt will chat with us about, and I will let you get to it. Right, right. So Erica is uh, from South Euclid and up near Cleveland. And um, <clears throat> a lot of the jumping off point or the reference points that Erica is using is a lot of, in this particular body work, <clears throat> nostalgia. So she's looking a lot at children's programming and sort of playing with those images that may be comforting to a lot of people, but altering sort of how you interpret or how they, she's interpreting them, but also how uh, they get sort of shifted when they get onto the wall. So this image of Cal U is massive in reference to sort of how you would normally experience that on a wall. Um, this image of Mr. Rogers, which kind of gets pixelated as you approach it because of the way that the, um, the grid of pom-poms is, is arranged. Uh, and then here we have uh, so my comfy, big comfy couch, the main character from that um, here displayed in a printed rug uh, in this you know, Da Vinci, Vitruvian man form. Um, yeah, so all of those kind of like, Erica does play a lot with pop culture references, but they also feel deeply personal, right? This sort of looks like, you can imagine that these are the programs that they watched growing up, um, it, and it feels somewhat universal for a lot of people. Um, so I, I think that sort of, they look familiar, but then they are put into uh, unfamiliar contexts. So, and I think a lot of artists, um, particularly through this most recent, the shutdowns and the pandemic, playing a lot with like, how does the familiar feel unfamiliar and how do we make the unfamiliar feel familiar? So I think both of those sort of directional things, that, the way that artists are thinking about the objects or the experiences they have in the world are at play in Erica's work. Yeah, and I know Erica is very interested in art history, so taking symbolism and iconography, so you could see it with the big comfy couch character, so pulling from pop culture, something that we recognize or that's familiar and also tied to childhood, and then pairing it with the form of this character with the Vitruvian Man, which is very much, you know, very art historical in reference. So again, like a combination of like highbrow I don't know, and pop culture, Again, what Matt said, you know, changing the context, making us revisit something that we know, but also making us think like, but what does this mean? So it leaves it a little bit more open-ended for the viewers to relate to it and try to figure out some new meanings. I really like, you said a little bit earlier about humor as a point of entry. Like it's, uh, it allows for a mass of people to come to the work that, um, and explore ideas that they might not have been able to without that um, familiarity and humor imbued. Um, so can you chat a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think humor is a really easy access point for people. It's invitational. Um, it allows room for someone to very easily contemplate and spend time with the piece. I think, you know, humor is an innate reaction and it's also a sensory experience that can be shared with others. So I think you know, it can also create not just a singular viewing experience, but also a collective experience. Yeah, it's a great, yeah, like you said, entry point is, I think, the key to when artists do use humor. Um, <clears throat> obviously, not everything works that way, but uh, when it happens, it's really, I think, kind of wonderful and, and pulls off something um, that does feel collective. It does feel like, oh, I'm sharing this experience as opposed to I'm, I'm experiencing this thing in isolation. Wonderful. So our, our next artist that we're going to have a look at is just behind us here, Sharon Kolblinger. You all want to chat a little bit about this? Yeah, I really love this piece. Uh, Sharon's based in Kent, Ohio, and she's really challenging our perception our, and our interaction with photography. So when we think about photography or image culture, it's so immediate, especially now we can consume thousands of images a day. I mean, you can scroll through Instagram and I think I, that's really changed our relationship to photos. So with Sharon, she's trying to slow down the viewing process. So she creates these very sculptural frames where the image is actually embedded 
behind these panels. And then there is a mirror in which reveals fragments of the images that we see. But the way to see those images or piece them together is by interacting with it. So you will have to move and contort your body, look at it from the side or from below, which I think also adds a level of playfulness and the interactive quality. And I just think it's a really interesting work for someone not only to look at, but to experience, because you have to physically interact with it. And it's also great too, like it's like a, it's like a live photograph or something, because it's like constantly, it's picking up, you're picking up images through and in the space and things that are existing outside of the photograph and being inserted into the photograph. So it, it does, it's probably also very difficult to film, but it does this like really wonderful thing of like, it, it becomes like a performance for the entire space. And uh, yeah, I, ideally when you come in to see this exhibition, you'll see it with other people and they'll all be kind of contorting their bodies to sort of figure out what the actual whole image is. But your, your mind kind of turns it into an entire one single image, but it still is this broken up fragmented piece. Yeah, I think it'd be very fun to not just view the images, but to view other people viewing the images. Yeah, so it, it imbues another kind of humorous aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it almost feels performative. I, I wouldn't say it's performance-based, but yeah. you definitely have to interact with it and you have to have some willingness to participate or maybe even be silly in the way that you might interact with this in a very non-traditional way. We're not viewing it from a distance. We're kind of abandoning the rituals that we typically take when we're looking at work. So I think that's, this work is very subversive on many different levels. And the other thing that's difficult to sort of just describe is it creates a, there's an illusion of space. Like it appears to sort of punch through the wall when you're looking at it and creates this other sort of secondary space within it. It's like, it's like a volume, even though it is just made up of flat images. I think this one also really smartly applies to the theme. A new because I haven't seen folks uh, force bodily uh, attention to a work in the way that this does. So it is a new world of kind of viewing as well. Yeah, it's like how, and but the images are important, but they're also somewhat sort of everyday ish, or at least mm -hmm. the the settings are, and. Um, it's really about, yeah, like talking about reordering the world, right? It's, uh, it's taking chunks out of uh, an image of an everyday world and um, inserting these weird shapes into it and these other sort of spaces from outside. It's, yeah, it's like, it's like a collision. Perfect. All right, well, let's uh, come around this corner here and, and talk about Megawa's work. So Mikiwa Arimo is an artist based in Yellowstone, Ohio. <laughs> Yellow Springs. Oh, Yellow, Yellow Springs, not Yellowstone. That's somewhere <laughs> else. Um, but her practice was very much influenced by the pandemic. So she started to move outside of the studio and very actively started taking hikes. Um, and during this process of taking her everyday hikes, she started thinking a lot about invasive species and what that means. So she, as an artist, is thematically interested in language and images and how that can change context. So thinking about the idea of invasive species and how those terminologies were also very similar to the way people were talking about um, the other or immigration issues. There's also a lot of tactile components in her work. So if you look at the fabric, um, I think this resonated with a lot of artists during this period of time, but going back to craft or something that felt a little bit more comforting in making. And she was telling me that uh, her mother was a hat maker and that she had some of these materials that were out in her studio or things that she saw as a child. So I think it was interesting that she also decided to integrate text with fabric, um, with found images, and it it's, creates a very interesting relationship. I think the, the, when we did the studio visit too, Miguel spoke about the sort of treks she was taking um, in the hikes as giving herself a, a 
residency. And I really like the way that she talked about that as sort of how do, how do I use this time where I'm sort of forced into a certain space um, to um, advance my practice. And I mean, she's brilliant, so she found a way. But uh, yeah, and the other, another component I like these on the pegs, these sort of like feel like they're hung up after uh, a walk and there's these straps um, that sort of make clear reference that these are meant to be sort of bundled. They feel like they're part of like scientific uh, field equipment or research-based equipment. So they, they have this allusion to interaction. They're not meant to be necessarily interacted with by visitors, but they, they have this sort of use um, component to them where they, they feel like they are objects made to be used for certain activities. Mm -hmm. And I know she was also thinking a lot about uh, the themes of safety and, you know, with the pandemic, you know, what was considered safe, like being in our home or being around loved ones was all of a sudden something that we had this heightened anxiety by and then going out and then now thinking about the idea of invasive species. What does that mean to our safety? Um, safety as being these parameters that are also like imposed and how those boundaries are consistently shifting. And I think that's interesting that she also tackles that idea through her work. Absolutely. Yeah, the, it's interesting to think about how very readily this applies to a specific and universal experience, but is also so um, nuanced. You all were talking about the fact that her, you know, living in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which is really well known for its hiking trails and, and things. So outside was a safe place. Inside our own personal spaces was a safe place. Um, everywhere else was generally off limits or unsafe. Fraught. Yeah, fraught, yeah. Um, and something that's always attracted me to Megawa's work is the opportunity for discovery, even within the work. The longer you look at it, you, the more you discover the more uh, tangents and uh, references to more than what you see are there. So could you chat a little bit about like maybe how in your discussions with her, um, how that came up and, and how she's kind of articulated that through her work and why you selected this particular piece? Good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I, the thing I, I think you, you mentioned a piece of sort of her working practice, which is like, it's, in, it's heavily research-based, right? So there's layers and layers and layers and layers of information that some of which are probably concealed from us, maybe intentionally, or just sort of that's just part of the process. So, but that level of research and meticulousness is present. Like you can sense that these objects don't just carry what the objects are telling you. There's a lot of other information that is sort of sitting in, in the back of these of these pieces. Like the, um, I can hear like just to sort of read through these objects. The, each of these individual objects that she's referencing in some of the images here have deep histories. Um, the words clearly have sort of elevated um, authority or import. Um, so. I, while some of it still feels maybe a little abstract without sort of, unless you sort of go in with the same amount of uh, determination that Migiwa goes into uh, to make these objects, they might, it might not reveal itself, but I don't think that's necessarily the important component. I think it's just sort of the, the, the idea that these objects exist and that the research has been, is, is present in them. Yeah, and I think that this body of work specifically in this exhibition are, in a huge reflection of the period of time we we're looking at artists. So this is a direct result of the pandemic. These were direct actions that she took in a way to like figure out her studio practice or find some sort of relief. But nevertheless, like the thematic components of exploring language and meaning and history and slippage as she talks about is so present in this work. But I feel like seeing this piece I definitely feel like her st this was a reflection of what was going on in the world. And she was, this is how she reimagined these things that were happening, not only to her, but to everyone. And I, I think it's very interesting that the more time you spend with this piece, you find various different components that 
divulge another meaning. Like if you go to this piece here and you look at this image of the deer, it talks about like at this time they, they thought like deer may also be infected with COVID or something like that. So again, this idea of safety or how information changes, how the parameters of safety change, et cetera. And I think that we'll see in a couple other projects here too, but like that idea of scientific research kind of is another piece of uh, the puzzle of this exhibition where artists are sort of, they're not researching the science for the science, they're researching the science for, in some cases maybe for the science, but also for the, um, the metaphorical values of, mm -hmm. of what, that, what that exploration reveals. Yeah, they tells definitely us about other things. humanize it. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So let's move on to Christina's work now. Christina has um, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional work, so we're kind of spread out in the gallery here, but um, at your leisure. Yeah, Christina is based in Cleveland, um, and uh, I I think of these, and I think she does too. These are they're, they're sort of like system-based. Um, so like the it's sort of like a kit of. Uh, shapes and images and re recurring imagery. Um, so I, there's systems that she sort of keeps sort of like reordering. And a lot of the, the basic components of it come from her explorations uh, in Eastern Europe. She is Estonian American. Um, a lot of the reference points are sort of post-Soviet architecture, not necessarily the architecture that was created in a post-Soviet world, but sort of what remains. Um, and what that architecture and the language of that architecture, the visual iconography of that architecture, what that sort of does or means in a society, right? So how, how these buildings were built um, and the design elements that built them, how does that sort of inform how you live um, and how you're meant to live? Uh, she takes those images and turns them into something, things that are like beautifully abstract, um, which I think is a really great way to sort of respond to that kind of thing. But you can certainly sort of see these elements, like even something as simple as like, you know, the brick components, the brick patterns, and the color palette as well is another piece that comes into play with these works. Um, and we were initially looking at the, um, the prints, these series of prints that she did um, while on uh, a residency. But then when we sort of started thinking about the space more, that's when we realized we really needed some of the sculptural objects, which I think have really great presence as well. Mm -hmm. um, and those sort of exist in relationship, and I think they're fun to think about. I mean, they really do feel like those, those prints come into real life, they come into form. Absolutely. Um, but they have an even more tactile presence. Yeah, I think there's definitely some playfulness with these sculptures as well. Um, when, when she's talk, you know, Matt spoke on her Estonian American heritage and she's interested in the idea of systems and imposed systems and structures. So we see that come through in the prints and also like the idea and the act of printmaking, the repetitive process as well. So subscribing to some form of system. I feel like the sculptures are like another way of kind of breaking that down. The forms are so abstract, they're playful. You don't necessarily look at them and understand exactly what they mean. But I think that opens it up for conversation. It makes mm -hmm. you delve deeper into it, take a closer look, and hopefully it compels you to maybe read the didactic materials that yeah. come along with the work. And they're really well observed, right? So like these objects come out of, they're not just sort of sprung forth from a brain. They're coming out of um, Christina sort of spending time in Estonia and other Eastern Bloc countries and sort of experiencing sort of what it feels like to be in those kind of spaces. And I, I, I don't know, I feel like you can sense that coming, coming through the objects and the prints. Yeah, I think they're interesting because they have an invitational austerity to them. I think like with the color palette, it's like pretty cold. And even like if you look at the prints, um, like some of the, the shapes, and there's some organic shapes, there's some that feel a little bit like maybe more sterile, but there are these like little pops of color and, and material that are like tactile and interesting. Um, so I like that there's a duality to, to her yeah, works. I think they're fire. like, yeah, they're like a little more complicated than 
you would initially like write when seeing them. They feel like simple forms, but there's like more to it than meets yeah. the eye. Yeah. They become almost anthropomorphic. They, yeah. they have a, a, a movement to them or an implied movement to them that's really lovely. And there's a great conversation between the prints and the three-dimensional works that it, you know, it, it absolutely has that um, reference to brutalist architecture, the heaviness mm -hmm. of it, um, and the human quality within it too. Yeah, I think that's, what, that's where that, the work meets, is that collapsing of sort of the, the brutalist architecture, but also how it's used, like how the, the people yeah. exist inside of it, mm -hmm. right? So that, those are the two things that I, f I feel like are present in these works. So it's the hand, right? It's the hand of the artist is present in these pieces when Absolutely. it isn't supposed to be in brutalist architecture. So. Right, great. So I, I think that uh, we can move over to uh, Michael and Michaela here, chat about this piece. Michael is an artist based in Dayton, and uh, this is uh, Michael has been working quite a lot uh, recently with, um, particularly this material. So this hook rugs, which are um, have become her sort of chosen mode of expression, um, and that's very very intentional. It's not, you know, just a matter of convenience. It's uh, it's a matter of sort of thinking about. It ties into the themes in her work, which is exploring not just women's roles, but how women's roles are depicted throughout art history um, and what those stories tell and up to what point they are told. Um, she observes that a lot of them are, a lot of the sort of art history narratives around women are sort of begin and end with motherhood. Uh, and that is a, has been the case throughout history. Uh, her stories sort of trade on that, but also sort of try to push push the boundaries beyond that. So, the idea that this is sort of a craft based piece is a is a reference to like is that you know woman's work, uh, as that's historically been defined. Um, so you can see like these sort of more modern contemporary looking images existing alongside sort of these Greco Roman images depictions of women, and that's a thing that Michael Lynn sort of explores throughout. Um, you know, other pieces in her body of work. She has sort of done these um, hook rug pieces that are about text messages between her and friends and partners. And, um, and they, they become sort of this really funny sort of analog way to sort of think about a digital uh, medium or digital mode of communication. Yeah, and I know that she started this process in 2019, so very much a response, again, like to the pandemic, where a lot of artists were trying to find like more tactile ways of making. I think like something that's tactile and repetitive was also a way of like passing time and getting reacquainted with art, maybe in like a different way. Therapeutic even? Yeah, like therapeutic. I, I mean, think it's physically. In, yeah, and I think it's interesting as an artist that, you know, she's very interested in, you know, the female body um, in issues of feminism, and she's like leaning into craft, which I think pejoratively sometimes can be described as like, it's like for women and it's not considered high art, but she takes that and she tries to be subversive. I think she's very successful and also like reintegrating these, again, these motifs from art history, but in a humorous way. Like if you look at these, these images of, you know, they look like almost like classical Greek bus. Um, they have that sort of aesthetic, but their faces are almost like, I don't know if they're dumbfounded <laughs> or afraid or it just, it's not how we typically experience them. And I think that's like very, very interesting. They kind of remind me of emojis in a way. I know that Michaelin likes have in her like other bodies of work with these rugs integrates um, text messages. So there are like technological components as she does in bed. So I don't know if that's intentional, but it does make me think about that. Yeah, and I, I always like, I mean, I, I like Michaelin's work quite a lot, but also I'm always impressed with the range of imagery she gets out of a hook rug, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is like, like they're incredibly expressive and like they have these real sort of personality to them. And like, you know, it's, it's a material that's um, or a process, I guess, that's, I would guess, is fairly un, 
uh, unforgiving, um, but she coaxes so many like cool images and sort of like really interesting uh, compositions out of it. Mm -hmm. And, and you often see like herself represented mm -hmm. in the work. Like you can see the central figure is a self-portrait. So yeah. I know that there are other rugs that reference like selfie culture and uh, maybe that re that examination of self also came during the pandemic where the self is readily available. But yeah, I think this work is yeah. really interesting and I want to touch it, but you can't yeah. touch it. Yes. <laughs> Le less in this piece, but I know in others too. And it's maybe something we haven't really talked about in relationship to this exhibition, but I talked to Michael in at length about man, boredom was a thing, like, right? Like, it still is, I guess, but uh, it's uh, how, how you sort of deal now with all this space that you have that's like interior space too, and like sort of like you know, you're spending this time with yourself and maybe your immediate family and maybe you need to find your own space outside of that, but it's hard to sort of figure out where that is. Um, so that, that sort of, this activity sort of gives you um, a focus for whatever period of time you're doing that activity too. So. Yeah, Michael Lynn does a great job of navigating um, the personal and the public mm -hmm. and like really kind of mashing them together in her work. I also really appreciate that uh, this is both hand tufted and machine tufted. Mm -hmm. So in order to get that kind of variety of texture, you can't just do it with a machine. And so there's that speaking to um, the culture of craft and the hand within it, um, like making sure that the hand is there as well as the machine and the importance of both, I think is really smart. Yeah. So let's move to Kara. To Kara, Kara, we can, maybe we start with here. Sure, do you um, want me to turn it on for a beat? Sure. Yeah, that would okay. be great. Um, we, we have it off just so that you can hear. So Kara is based in North Olmsted, Ohio. And uh, she's really interested in virtual reality, so occupying virtual spaces. I almost feel like she conducts these ethnographies or like ethnographic research where she occupies these virtual spaces and conducts research. She also manipulates these realities. So I think they're very accessible because she kind of leans into these fantasy role-playing games and like takes that format or the aesthetic. So you could see from the video monitor, it's giving you like several commands. Uh, let me be a friend to man. And I know that the title of this piece, it says Plainchant for Paper Hands. It kind of alludes to medieval songs. So she's interested in the aspect of religion and how that collides with the virtual and the physical. So we could see here that there are multiple fans that are coming through this arch-shaped portal. Portals are another huge thematic component in this work. So with the fans running, you feel the breeze and you hear the sound and the vibrations, which I feel like kind of the sound, it feels almost like they're, they're in harmony, which I think kind of ties into that medieval songs that I talked about with the title. Um, and these portals, like multi-layer portals, so this physical portal, this virtual portal, and then if we move to this end, we have, I would say, I would argue that this is like another level of exploring virtual spaces in these paintings. These are also considered portals. And if you look closely, they're very abstracted architectural forms that you wouldn't necessarily get like immediately unless you take a closer look but again we're exploring another dimension but this time it's in a more tactile material format as opposed to a digital format i like to tie it back a little bit to uh to trans work as well like i think there's like a weird sort of flip side of the coin kind of like they're both sort of looking at like online communities a lot um and also using some kind of, you know, we have the milk crates over here, but also using like these kind of like DIY um, construction strategies as it were, but coming up with wildly different interpretations of what those online communities mean and do and how they interact um, and totally different aesthetics as well. Um, I, I, I like that they've, they sort of found like a similar, they occupy a similar space, but have completely different interpretations of those spaces. Uh, yeah. And the, the, I liked what you said about the 
these are, <laughs> they're like, they're obviously physical paintings, but they're virtual uh, mm -hmm. paintings of, yeah, they play yeah, with like, like how you multi, exist in that space. Yeah, multi-level or avenues of virtual exploration. Because yeah. I think we typically view virtuality or virtual spaces as being digital spaces, but there is like a level of virtual explorations when you look at something so abstracted where 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 is your brain going? What space are you actually occupying? It's very abstract. I mean, paintings are just VR. Is that right? <laughs> That's not right. Maybe. They are. It's also interesting that she incorporates uh, perspective lines mm -hmm. in these works as maybe uh, helping to cue us into the idea of layering or depth or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there's a heart, there's an art historical component to that too, right? Of like sort of, you know those issues of perspective were often explored, you know, first through, you know, like that Renaissance art even before that. But um, yeah, so yeah, I, just, I, I hadn't thought about these as virtual spaces, but you're a hundred percent right. It's really yeah. interesting. I think it's because she refers to them as portals, which that yeah. links so much to virtual spaces. So it's like we have these material painterly portals and then we have this architectural portal of these, like the arch of, um, what are those crates milk called? Crates. Those crates. milk crates. And then we have again, like this digital virtual portal, which is also like a <laughs> rectangle with an image, but that's, you know, yeah. that's what our understanding of virtual has become. So I think it's just, it's very smart. I think it's, it's interesting that she's also playing with our understanding of a virtual space yeah, and kind sure. of expanding it. Yeah. Cool. So that naturally kind of takes us over to Callista's work, which will be hard to document, but you'll get sore. the gist. It's sore. Yeah. Uh, Callista Lion is based in Columbus, Ohio. And I know that this piece was in collaboration with Carmen Winant. And she's very interested in this concept of ecological grief. So sort of this like sadness that may come with um, seeing some sort of ecological destruction or you know, us learning about like environmental issues. And I know that Callista is very you know, ecologically, um, she's always thinking about these issues within her work and how she's actually producing work. So if you look at the pieces, you see that she's using these CRTVs. So instead of buying new monitors, she's gonna try to source ones that have already been used. I think that's also part of her not wanting to add to waste. Another thing I like to do, like also tying this back to um, uh, Migiwa's work, right? This is also sort of a very heavily research-based practice that sort of yields these, this sort of collective installation that while you may not necessarily sort of immediately grasp the science um, in one sitting, you sense the the the, um, the exploration that's happening and sort of how deep it goes. Mm -hmm. And I know that she is interested in how humans' relationships with water specifically can kind of turn into this idea of collective care or how can we produce collective care. And a lot of the motifs that you see that are reoccurring in these multiple screens, so you'll see like amniotic sacs bursting you'll see dams exploding, and then you'll see various other forms of rushing water. So there's something that feels very cathartic, simultaneously violent, but there's still like this hopeful sort of undertone that even though these things are happening, that there's always potential for change, um, which I think is like a pretty lovely sort of optimistic take on you know, what we consider like environmental disasters or destruction. It's a real collapsing of the the massively global and the deeply personal. Mm -hmm. They're like presented here sort of in the same exact same space. Yeah, and it's interesting how she also set up this installation is in this circular format. So you're kind of confronted with so many different moving images at once at any angle. I think that it can almost be a little disorienting because there's also sound like a narration that plays um, above these images as well. And I think that sort of narration allows you to spend more time in the space because you want to hear how this story unfolds. And I think that will naturally make you 
make connections between what is being said as, and what is being seen. Yeah, there's a lot of work in the show that I think rewards spending some time with. Yeah. And reveals itself over time. Considering a new world. So um, I'm going to bring Andrew over here and close us out. So this is A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023. Thank you so much for joining us. A big thank you to the governor, the legislature, and the Ohio Arts Council's board who supports the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. <laughs>